Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Makate. Thank you for inviting me and uh, greetings to my colleagues. I'm seeing that there's quite a number of colleagues from, from the School of Management, IT and Governance. And to the young people in the room, ATA. <laughs> uh, Prof. McCarthy gave me quite a difficult task, really, uh, because we all know how difficult funding is to get by. It's very difficult. We battle at an individual level. We battle uh, in our families. We battle at various levels of the institutions. Uh, to secure funding that will help us to carry out our needs. Uh, but as we battle, uh, we do know that there's never enough money around. It's a case of uh, working smart and being able to identify the appropriate sources for the appropriate needs, and once received, we utilize it um, effectively, efficiently, and very responsibly. So I'm going to talk to you about the research that is available both internally within the university, but also externally, um, nationwide, nationally, and actually internationally as well. One basic fact is that postgraduate studies in terms of numbers, that is increasing in the universities within the country and many other countries, there are so many students getting into the postgraduate uh, stream. But the funding is not increasing in the same proportions. And so we have a problem of more and more students wanting to access a decreasing pot of funds. And so it is from that context that we look at postgraduate um, postgraduate funding. You will really uh, uh, forgive me. I'm not one that does animations in PowerPoints, but my daughter was practicing her PowerPoint skills, and she really did strange things here. So, and I don't know how to remove it. So you will forgive me when you see strange things happening on the screen. The first uh, form of funding that is available that I'll discuss with you is that one that is internal to the university and broadly is generally given on the basis of excellence. So if you have been an excellent achiever on your honors program and you're now progressing to the master's program, or if you've been an excellent achiever on the master's program and you're progressing to the doctoral program, the university welcomes you. They are very happy to have you, and they're going to support your research funds. For instance, for those students who scored an average of 70% in their honors class, they do get a remission when they go to their master's class to the value of 80% of their tuition, which is very, very generous. And you need not have been within UKZN to access this, even if you've been in another reputable university, you will be able to access it if you can prove that you did actually achieve the equivalent of 70% in your honors. Then there are those who, uh, when they get cum laude, when they get summa cum laude, they're going to receive automatic awards of 22,500, of 25,000, respectively, when they proceed to their full-time postgraduate study. Now, these first three are uh, excellent scholarships that are distributed at a university-wide level. You will find that being handled by the scholarship office. So this kind of automatic, if you've been a member of the institution at registration, the system will pick it up and it will be given automatically. Uh, I think as of last year, if I'm correct, the college, the College of Law and Management Studies went on a drive to attract honor students. And there is a college bursary for 20,000 for honor students, as well as master students who are within the College of Law and Management Studies. This one is through uh, the postgraduate administrative staff. That would be Angela Peirce. I think it's a name everybody knows, is right? Yeah. Is there anyone here who doesn't know Angela Peirce? Yeah. Or Nadia Ali? Yeah. There are people who don't know her. Yeah. Oh, OK, we will have to. I don't know how you registered. <laughs> 
Oh, in PMB, okay. In PMB, it would be. Is Debbie here? That's you. Oh, okay. Nice meeting you. I've heard of you, but we never quite met. Okay, so there is Debbie, and later on I'll tell you somebody else who is responsible for the university wide. And his name is Sandile, but that's um, later. So for these, at the beginning of the year, as part of the registration clearance process, you would be sorting that out. So by the time you register, the the funding is is already available. It's kind of almost automatic if you have excelled as a student previously. And then uh, there is the full free uh, fees, fee remission that is given to full-time masters and PhD students. The, the key word there is full-time. So if you are um, a part-time master's student, even if, it is, even if you're doing full research and not coursework, you will not be able to access that one. The guidelines, again, are very clear. Full-time postgraduates <coughs> registering for the first time need to realize this money is only for tuition. It does not cover your residences. It does not cover um, your research. Again, this one is also accessed on registration and is kind of almost automatic. So those are the, oh, there we go. <laughs> um, OK, for, for the uh, another, another funding stream available for doctoral students now, those who are doing um, active research, is the university doctoral grant. It used to be administered by the research office, but with the, the college restructuring, it's now administered at the college level. So even if, as a doctoral student, you have received your full remission, once you have uh, received your ethical clearance, you can apply for a doctoral grant, which will help you specifically with research-related activities. So it would pay for things like travel to your research area. It will pay for, for your editor. It will pay for um, just a few gadgets, not much. It won't buy you an iPad or anything like that. But you just might be able, perhaps, to buy a dictaphone, something for 2,000 rands um, and the like. Because it is a maximum of 30,000, uh, it is, again, almost automatic if you have ethical clearance as a doctoral student within the university. But of course, like I said, the pot is shrinking. And so even though it says that you're going to get a maximum of 30,000, depending on what is available for a particular year within that particular college, it will be shared um, equally. And you just might get maybe 10,000, 15,000. But you'll usually get um, something that will help you at least travel. The call for the applications comes out once a year. It hasn't come out for this year yet. So for those doctoral students who have already received your ethical clearance, just listen out for the call. It's probably going to come out within the next few months. Um, I'm not sure. But I'll tell you the, uh, later on the person who is responsible for that. So what I've discussed with you so far um, are the funding streams available internally within the university. Now, what's available externally? Sorry, Betty. I'm sorry to do this. Just go back to that slide um, on the 30,000 for the PhD. Can you clarify for the, uh, for the audience if it's for students who are in full-time um, study? Because if they are an employee, uh, I would think they won't qualify for that, isn't it? No, 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 no. no. This is purely for research-related activities. It is not tuition. It is purely for research-related activities. So it does not matter whether you're, you're a full-time PhD student or a part-time PhD student, as long as you're a PhD student who has received ethical clearance and you need to go and do your research, you, you, you qualify for that. Right. Now for the external funding. Uh, you can see that with the previous one, it was you know, values of 30,000, 20,000, this, that, and the other. Now the real big money is actually external, the NRF, the NRF. NRF, for those of you who might know, it stands for the National Research Foundation. It is a statutory body. Uh, that means it was established as an act of parliament. And its mandate 
is to develop knowledge within the country. So they have a mandate to ensure innovation, to ensure that there's quality research, to ensure that they increase the pool of master's students, they increase the pool of um, doctoral students, but most importantly, that they increase knowledge, innovative knowledge that will help develop uh, the society. Because as we all know, knowledge is, is the driving engine behind economic and social development. So the National Research Foundation is tasked by parliament with that mandate. Uh, that is why it, is, it falls under the Department of Science and Technology, uh, so it is Derek Honeycomb's baby. It draws money from public coffers, and so when you apply for this money, you actually are drawing on your taxes. So it is something that you are entitled to, to a certain extent. And there's quite a number of those. The first one is uh, what is called the NRF freestanding. Gives you 80,000 if you're a doctoral student, it gives you 60,000 if you are a master's student, and that is per annum. So hey, we're talking about good money here. Um, the call comes out annually. It is the kind of thing that you apply for online. I will take you through the, the correct, um, the, I'll give you the, the address later on, and also advise you on how to go about it. Apart from the NRA freestanding, there is also, uh, there will be scholarships or bursaries that are distributed through the NRF system, but are not necessarily of the NRF system. They would be tagged or linked to a particular sector of society. Say for instance, there will be, um, as I will show you later, NRF that is related directly to engineering or NRF that is directed to IT or NRF that is directed to something. So it is not a freestanding, but it is pegged to a particular sector of society. Then there is, there is um, the grant-linked scholarship from the NRF. I don't know if we can say much about that. I think it is more popular in the sciences, but we do have some academics who are grant holders of NRF funding. Now, if you're a grant holder, you are allowed to nominate students who will then receive automatic funding from the NRF. For instance, I just recently received a grant and I'm looking out for students. I need a PhD student and I need two master's students. The problem with that, <laughs> any takers? <laughs> Yeah, the problem with that is, of course, being grant linked, it will mean that you would have to fit within a particular uh, research stream. Um, yeah, so there is that. Not many to go by, but if they're available, the particular grant holders, the particular academics will publicize them on the university land or through some form, um, other form of communication. Then there is the German scholarship, the, it's called DAD. Uh, D-A-A-D stands for, it's a German word. Don't ask me what it means, but it's something to do with exchange in research between two countries or something along that. Right, now let us go briefly through each and every one of them. Again, forgive these animations, please. Right, the NRF freestanding. It is not pegged to any sector of society as long as you're registered within the university, the higher education institution of South Africa, you are eligible. The objectives is to contribute towards an increased number and quality of South African postgraduates. So these would be students at a master's and doctoral level within South African institutions. And it gives, there is also the possibility uh, that you will get it even if you're not within a South African institution, they would give you money, for instance, to go and travel abroad to, to finalize and pursue uh, research study opportunities at international universities. But of course, we don't want you to do that. We want you to study with us. Okay, there is the DAD NRF in country master's doctoral program. DAD, oh, there's the word. It starts for, in, in German, it means German Academic Exchange Services. 
This one is given in partnership with the National Research Foundation. In other words, the NRF is the one that actually manages the grant on behalf of, um, of, of the German program. Postgraduate studies at the University of South Africa. This particular one, uh, the NRF in-country program, is actually aimed, it's particularly keen on uh, developing future academic staff members of South African institutions. And I'm seeing that there are um, academic members of staff in here who are perhaps pursuing their masters and doctoral students. So you would really be very good, um, uh, you, you, you would stand a very good chance if you applied for this particular funding stream, since you are already a member of staff within the university. Tutors obviously would also stand a chance as would the academic development officers. In other words, if they can see that you have a leaning and an interest in getting into mainstream academia, you just might be lucky there. Okay, I think I need to do something, right? Okay, now what is the eligibility in general? Obviously, the different funding streams do have, uh, uh, they do have specific requirements, but in general, these scholarships are open to full-time registered students. They are open to South African citizens or permanent residents of the country. Uh, that might not be good news for some of our students, unfortunately. Uh, but remember, this is pub it's, it's public funds, it's public coffers, and it is geared towards transforming the South African society. So I guess one can understand that it is meant for South African citizens and South African permanent residents who are going to contribute to the economy um, long term. Full-time employees of higher education institutions are generally not eligible for the NRF master's freestanding one, right? Or the NRF that is linked to certain sectors. But you are eligible to the DAD, and there are also lots of other funding streams for, um, for uh, full-time academic members in higher institutions. There's the Tutuka grant, for instance. Uh, which is available to people who are in full-time employment uh, of the higher education institutions of the country. Scholarship holders, those full-time students who hold an NRF grant, they must not hold full-time salaried employment during the tenure of the award. Remember, it is given to a full-time student. So you can't be a full-time student, as Given was telling us, and at the same time be fully employed elsewhere. It is also possible for scholarship holders of the NRF grants to hold other supplementary grants. In other words, you may hold an NRF grant, but at the same time be able to hold a UKZN doctoral grant, for example or perhaps be able to hold some other uh, DAD grant or you know, other specific grant that might be available. So there's no problem there. Uh, in some cases, the NRF will give you certain conditions. It might give you conditions. If you're holding the NRF grant, you might uh, be expected, for instance, to undertake teaching activities. You might be expected to undertake tutorials, assistance, and demonstrations per week, and the, the numbers are specific, where you will um, be, in other words, you're contributing to academic development during the year of study. The selection criteria generally includes academic merit. So you somehow have to prove in your application that you are capable of finalizing this degree. Uh, there should be some promise of researchability. People we should be able to see that there are leadership qualities here. Remember, it is something competitive. 
if it's something, anything that is competitive, you need to have an edge over the others. You have to show that you, you, you are not the ordinary male, that there is a lot of potential in you. In addition to that, the award of the scholarship is based on feasibility and merit of the applicant's research project proposal. Uh, if you are applying for a grant, it's not just a case of providing your student number. You provide on application a research proposal. And it has to be a research proposal that is interesting. You know, remember the mandate of the NRF? It's about innovation. It's about contributing to social and economic development. So the research proposal that you present on application, it has to be something that has the wow factor, you know? Uh, what is this research going to add to anybody's life? If you are to be given 80,000 rands, you better well deliver some quality research. So the, um, the feasibility and merit of the applicant's research project proposal is obviously going to stand well in your stead. S successful students are offered the scholarship by the NRF they are required, obviously, there are certain terms. Remember, we're dealing with public funds here. So there are certain terms that you will be expected to abide by, and you will sign a scholarship agreement, which will be communicated to the successful recipient um, once the award is granted. A list of successful candidates is published on the NRF website as soon as the internal grants are approved. So there is a lot of transparency. There's a lot of openness. Um, as should always be whenever one is dealing with, with public funds. Uh, I think I should now perhaps point you towards uh, specific contacts that might help you. The most important, I think, which you should really familiarize yourself with is the NRF submission um, website and it's something that you can you know you can start registering with it once you've registered there's a clear process it is a very user-friendly um, system these days which is a very great improvement because it used to frustrate lots of researchers um, but apart from the NRF with regard to the university ones there is the student portal on the UKZN website this one clarifies the various bursaries, the various scholarships that are available for the honors students, for the master's students. I think you need to take that responsibility and find out what is available there. For the doctoral students, remember the doctoral grant that I spoke about? That one is administered at the college level and the person in charge of that administratively is uh, Miss Crystal Haddon. That is her extension number, 1553. Uh, but by and large, it is really under the College Dean of Research, and our College Dean of Research is Professor Ntlama. It's very important, um, and that's why I'm giving you the names, it's really very important that you take the responsibility to find out what is there, to understand how the university is structured, to know, for instance, who your dean of research is at the college level, to know who the academic leader of research is, so that when you have issues, you know where to channel your questions. Yeah. And there is never an excuse for not knowing. One thing that I really dislike, something I really hate hearing, is to say that nobody told me Nobody told me. It's your responsibility to find out, right? Matters we try to tell you what is available, um, you know, through such interactions that are organized at the college level.